Hey everybody, Shane here. They say that fighting is 50% physical and 50% mental. The thing is, when we injure our body, we have plenty of resources to diagnose and rehab the issue. But when our mental state is compromised, we're often told to shut up and train harder. Sometimes this works. Sometimes it makes things a whole lot worse. In a martial arts gym, it should be a safe environment for anybody. However, I know too many people who have fallen victim to both physical and psychological abuse from their instructors and from fellow teammates. And this type of disgusting behavior needs to be exposed and eradicated. That's why we here at Fight Tips are very happy to bring awareness to the importance of mental health and provide a resource for anybody who's struggling or just feeling off. So you're about to watch an interview with two of my favorite people. Vince the Anomaly Cachero, who's a retired UFC fighter and Fight Tips coach, sits down with Aaron Hurley, an esteemed Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu Cabrini black belt and founder of Submit the Stigma, plus she's a Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu coach here on Fight Tips. They talk about what to look for when finding a new gym, how to deal with depression and anxiety while training, and how to help a fellow teammate if they're dealing with mental issues. So please enjoy this chat with Vince and Aaron. So Aaron, we're very excited to talk to you and have you share your experience with the Fight Tips family. Um, you're an esteemed BJJ black belt under Cobrino with loads of experience competing at a high level. Plus you fought in MMA. So let's start at the beginning. What got you interested in martial arts and what made you stick around for as long as you have? It's funny that you say that to stick around. Um, Jiu-jitsu is definitely, I think, a sport of longevity compared to other sports. Um, I found jiu-jitsu after being on an online uh, hardcore music forum called The B9. It no longer exists. It was kind of just this like online thing that people could just like talk shit and, you know, just, uh, yeah, just find shows and all that. And there was a thread about jujitsu and there was a guy that wanted to come out to LA because he was going to compete at the pans. And he's like, do you want to hang out while I'm there? And I said, sure. So he brought me to a tournament, um, which was the pans in 2008. And I saw females competing. I was introduced to the culture. I thought it was amazing. So I realized that this could be something that could be my thing. Um, and I always roughhouse with guys. So like it just made sense. And then it wasn't until like a year later when I had the the um the nerve to walk into a gym and it happened to be Hamala Bahal, who is, you know, multiple time world champion. So for me, it was very clear that I was gonna go in there and learn to compete. Um and I started competing three months in and I was just hooked. Yeah. Yeah. I remember once that jujitsu bug bites you, you're kind of stuck. It's such a interesting sport where you can see that growth and progress, right? You just got to keep mm -hmm. coming in, keep showing up. I love that. Um, now yeah. you did mention, you know, being a woman entering martial arts, that is something a little different. Do you find that there's a stigma around being a female martial artist? And if so, what advice do you have for women thinking about entering the space? I wouldn't say there's a stigma. I think that the culture itself is male dominated and that can just be sort of intimidating um, because jujitsu is a combat sport, right? Full contact. So you're getting right in there. Um, there's only so many solo drills you can do before you have to work with a partner. And especially around the time that I started, I was the only female. There may be a couple of females that would come in and try a class, but I was like the one that was super, super dedicated from the start. And so I found trouble, like trying to find people that were even small. Um, and so I wasn't able to work out like a way for me to train with a lot of females without having to drive three hours in traffic. Um, even though I'm in LA, which is, you know, kind of a Mecca. And so, you know, training, training with females was a luxury at the time. Um, and so training with men, I felt was a little more realistic. Um, so obviously it, it takes a certain man to like be comfortable with them. And I had some guys that I'd already known outside of jujitsu and I started training with them. So I felt really comfortable. So I guess it's just about finding, um, that, that safe environment where you feel comfortable, um, and knowing that like, you're not going to get hurt and then maybe starting out. And like nowadays there's so many females. So I think you can just start training in a female only class would be great or, go into a, um, a gym where you've been able to test out the environment or like word of mouth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, definitely since I think 2008, when you started, it's, it's changed. The space has changed a lot and it's, it's a lot more welcoming to females, but, um, you know, regardless, it does take some courage to stand up for mental health in a space that's still more male dominated. Um, and it often, it often embodies kind of like that shut up and work ethos. I know that you've been a part of that, especially as we've been training MMA and stuff together too. Yeah. That's a pretty dominant thing there. Um, so why did you create your nonprofit then? Submit the stigma. 
Um, well, I have my own mental health issues that I kind of, co- it coincided with my jujitsu journey because I didn't know how mentally ill I was. Um, and I had a lot of outbursts during training when I would get frustrated, I would actually cry. Um, I would get frustrated to the point where if someone passed my guard, I would just be like, well, it's over. Just, just submit me, um, a really defeatist attitude. And so being in, in jujitsu teaches you to be in uncomfortable positions and then having to work out of it with technique rather than just panicking because panicking gets you in trouble. Panicking can get you arm barred. Panicking can get you submitted sooner. So it doesn't help. And it kind of translates to, to life. And so I was challenging myself in a safe position where I felt like, okay, there's not that many consequences. I can always tap. So that helped me to kind of branch out to my own mental health. And I got diagnosed with ADHD, um, depression, anxiety, Um, and so I started seeking a therapist. I started going to a psychiatrist and getting medicated for my ADHD and it really helped me. And I learned that there's a lot of other people who might be suffering the same, but not have the, the, the nerve, I guess, to, to go out and try something or to find a therapist or to seek professional help, or even the easiest thing, which is just to speak to someone about it and say, Hey, I'm dealing with this and I would like help. Um, and so I started submit the stigma as a campaign. Um, and it initially, the, the biggest catalyst was my dad's suicide. So when I first started and I was coming to terms with my own mental health, it was my father's suicide that really triggered me to focus on other people because I could use it as an example. Not many people speak about the word suicide. Um, they don't often reveal suicide as a cause of death because they don't want to feel like they're being blamed for not doing anything or, you know, having so many questions and it makes people uncomfortable. So I sought out to make people less uncomfortable and okay with talking about it. And the more you talk about it, the more that stigma gets submitted. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that is something that, um, you know, people don't talk about much and it takes a lot of bravery and courage to do that. So obviously I've been seeing you do this for a minute now and, you know, from us, from me and Shane, that's why we want to talk to you about it, because it does take a lot to kind of stand up and just say something, say anything. And you've been out there really outspoken for a long time. And obviously, that's why we love you. That's why we're supporting <laughs> here with this interview. Um, what are some current initiatives that you guys are working on with Submit the Stigma? So right now we have a workshop that we have for Mental Health Conscious Academy. It helps people like academy owners and instructors to approach people that they are concerned about, um, whether it's someone who can't focus or they stopped training or they didn't um, you know, come to training for a long time and you're worried about them. It's how to approach those sensitive topics, how to approach with empathy, non-judgment. And uh, we do some role playing so that they can be certified and show that they are understanding of people who might be dealing with mental issues. Um, and so, as part of the Suicide Awareness Month, which is September, we are going. We're doing a forty for forty fundraiser. So every forty seconds, a um, a person dies by suicide in the world, um, and that's according to the World Health Organization. And so we want to have people roll for forty minutes straight to kind of commemorate and honor the people that have both attempted and completed suicide, and to just raise awareness that. This is still a really big problem, whether people that you know talk about it or not. So hopefully getting people to talk about it um, will help people to deal with it. And also it just raises awareness and education that this is an issue that we are still dealing with. And even though you may not know someone that directly um, deals with it, you may not know that because they didn't tell you or simply, um, you know, I mean, it's just a matter of time before someone is affected, you know. Yeah, yeah, no, it it very much is one of those things. And I really love that initiative um, for this month that's coming up here, that 40 to 40. We definitely want to get more people in on that. And I see you guys working on that coaching side, getting these people trained and able to recognize um, students or people who are part of the academy who are struggling. What actionable advice do you have for people who, let's say, are kind of struggling themselves, they are the people withdrawing. Because, you know, even myself, I've been one of those guys as well. Like, I'm going to stop training as much when, um, you know, my my brain's not doing so well. What would you say to people like that? 
Yeah. So I always say that, uh, you know, giving and extending help is just as hard as um, accepting help. Um, the same with asking. So these are all separate processes that take a lot of nerve um, for people to do. So, you know, in order to accept help, that means that you have to speak to someone that you do have an issue um, and that you do want to explore it. And that takes that takes a lot of nerve to do. So when you um, need to accept help or ask for it, it's best to focus on those who love you because a lot of times mental illness or mental health issues can make you think that you are a burden. Um, and that's just not, that's not the case. Um, and that people who love you want to help you. So if you don't give them the opportunity, then it would be hard for you to, to get the help you need. There are also resources. There's the suicide hotline or crisis hotlines. Um, and now we have the, the text number for that. And then we also have, I say we as in like the country, um, has resources for you to look it up on your own. You know, um, sometimes with stigma, they don't want anyone else to know yet, but they still want to look into the opportunities they have to to speak about it with a health professional. And I always say that a professional is the best way to go. Mm -hmm. So going into those online, like National Alliance of Mental Illness, or even the Smith of Stigma website, we have resources there as well. And just educating yourself on possible signs and symptoms and going from there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Those are all great resources. And I know uh, we'll push some of our followers there because you have some resources on your website too. Um, now, since we are uh, talking here with, uh, we're a community of, of underdogs, right? The underdogs yeah. of flight tips. When we are looking to join these gyms, when we are looking to embed ourselves um, with these communities, what should we be looking for in terms of finding the right gym vibe and atmosphere for us, especially when it comes to mental health? Because I know that you know, as someone who has had to move around, travel a bunch, yep. each dim, gym has its different vibe. And it's really hard to kind of explore that, especially while you are kind of straining in the brain to get used to new places and things like mm -hmm. that. So what would you uh, advise for anyone looking to, to join a new gym? What kind of atmosphere are you looking for? One of the biggest ways is to see if females are there. Um, a lot of the time, like toxic machismo or masculinity will be present. If there's no females, that means that usually it's about how tough you are not showing weakness. And those can be huge barriers to getting help. Um, and so while having females doesn't necessarily ensure that it's this like safe, welcoming environment, it's usually a good sign just from the outset. And then just seeing how the instructors speak to their students. Do they talk about their life? their lives? Do they talk about personal things that, because you can't ignore that your personal life affects you on the mat. We like to say that you forget all of your issues, but there are some things that are personality related, right? We can't just be less sensitive all of a sudden um, or get less frustrated through errors. Um, so we have to accept that people are who they are and meet them where they are. So usually just the discussions that go on on the mat and just seeing how instructors and like staff members speak to people and if it's genuine and if it's led by empathy, if they, if they say things like, oh yeah, I did this or I did that. Um, sometimes that can help with the relatability and it also can show that they're willing to be, be vulnerable and show like, man, I know what it was like to be a white belt. I struggled too. That is so comforting to hear rather than saying something like, oh yeah, it's just part of the process. Everyone's got to go through it. It sucks. Right. Yeah. I've definitely experienced both sides of those coaches who are very empathetic coaches who are hard asses. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you need a little bit of both, um, but it really yeah. does make a difference. Um, and when you are joining these gyms, I think that whole community vibe it is a very important part of it. Now this uh, kind of brings us into our next thing. It looks like you are actually um, adding to your impressive list of accomplishments, you're currently pursuing a degree in sport and performance psychology, which obviously involves what we were just talking about in coaching. Mm -hmm. What are your goals with that? My goal, I right now, um, I'm like a little bit over halfway through the program. And then I have like mentorship and um, supervising for the certification process for the certified mental performance consultant. What I wanna do is obviously less clinical, otherwise I would be doing a counseling degree, but I wanna work with people who need to deal with their mental game to achieve their goals. At first I wanted to work with elite athletes and then I realized that even hobbyists struggle with um, adherence to training and motivation and concentration and all of those like arousal, anxiety, everything. So I realized that more so than just the people that perform, 
Um, but the people who use martial arts and combat sports as a way to mediate their life and to find well-being. And so I want to actually teach coaches how to coach with ethics and empathy and learning how to help their athletes rather than just um, tell them you need to do this, you need to be this, but without explaining it. And I also want to prevent abusive coaching tactics that are disguised as old school mentality, or uh, you're not tough enough to be in our gym. Um, I think that everyone can teach themselves heart. Uh, they can build that heart. They can build that um, mental toughness. And some people are just more sensitive like myself. Um, it doesn't mean that I'm not tough or strong. Um, it just means that I require a little bit more either attention or guidance um, than other people. And so I'm, I'm just the one that spoke out and said, I need more. And other people are like, no, 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 that's totally fine. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's perfect. I mean, all your ventures now going with all the sports psychology, I think it's going to go hand in hand with your advocacy work and mental health um, and everything that you're doing at Submit the Stigma. So how can the Fight Tips underdogs find you guys and support you for Submit the Stigma? Uh, the website, submitthestigma.org, and that links to our workshop where you can sign up. We teach it once a month online virtually. Um, you can also support us, donate, you can buy merch, and you can see those resources that we have as well as the 40 for 40 fundraising campaign. And we also have an Instagram account. So we release facts every week and we also collect stories uh, from people like you that want to explain how jujitsu or combat sports has affected their mental health in a positive way. Um, and so we have stories at submitthestigma.org is the email for that. Um, and the Instagram is just submit the stigma. And then my personal is Aaron Hurley. Perfect. Yeah, well, we will definitely check those out, Aaron. Thank you so much for talking with us today. And we will see you hopefully on Fight Tips again soon. Thank you.